All right, everyone, on today's episode, understanding the magic of compound interest and investing for beginners. Welcome to Chooseify. All right, guys, really excited to dive into this week's content. Uh, one of the things that I should just preface this episode by saying is that this is a crowdsource show, which means we're trying to create content that serves our audience and our community, and the community has gotten a lot larger. A lot of people are finding this, and they have questions that haven't been answered by, you know, maybe the last dozen episodes because they're just getting started. And so we thought we could take a look at just what the feedback that we're getting in the emails and what's being mentioned in the group and put a couple of those really important high value questions together and build an episode around it. And one of the things that I think is really a sticking point for even those of us that have been on this path for a long time is truly understanding the magic of compound interest and comparing and contrasting that with, with something like simple interests. And so to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. And yeah, we got this, uh, this great question in our main choose a five Facebook group from Kimberly. And actually we got a bunch of questions in the last week or two that all kind of coalesced into, Hey, let's make an episode about just a lot of these fundamental topics. And I think this, I think and hope this episode will be really helpful to a lot of people who are just getting started on this journey. And also frankly, people who have been on the path to five for a while, but just maybe never got these lessons. You know, a lot of us, we didn't learn personal finance growing up, right? So I think it's really important to every so often go back to these fundamental basics and just really dive deep into them. And Brad, to your point, I think this is, this is a really big deal. When people feel like they have money, they're burning the money in their pocket, it's burning a hole in their pocket and they have to spend it. It's because they haven't completely latched onto the power of the concept that we're describing right now. So like, like for context, we're talking about getting to financial independence, getting to the point where working is optional, getting to the point where your investments are producing enough income for you to live for the rest of your life. And really probably in many cases have a pretty substantial amount of money left over after you pass away. That is to compare and contrast that right now, when we get a paycheck and we have, you know, five or $10 left over, you know, whatever, um, the, you know, if we, if we keep it in our drawer, we just have $5. It's a question of, do we spend the $5 a day or do we spend it tomorrow? We're like, well, you only live once. Let me just spend it today. The piece that isn't connected is no, if you optimize that, you can create a scenario where your investments are creating for you $5 of income, except times, you know, multiples of thousands. And you never have to go figure out how to earn that $5 again. It's just taken care of. This is a massive, massive space between our initial understanding of money and what it can be used for. And once you understand, you understand the game, you understand the rules. This actually makes it easier to save money for your goals because you understand the why. Cannot put too much emphasis on your understanding of this and your ability to communicate it to your friends, to your family, to your kids. And so, Brad, I know you said you got a uh, message from the community and I'd love for you to share it with our audience. Yeah. So Kimberly asked this question in the Facebook group and she said, I searched the history, but still need help with understanding compound interest. Can I have some feedback on very basic principles of a compound interest account? And there's a lot, a lot there, Jonathan, right? So Kimberly is basically asking, what is compound interest? I, I need help with just this understanding of what compound interest is and really why is it so important, right? Why do we talk about it in passing so much? But really, you know, Jonathan, like we're saying, we don't really dive deep into the basics of this all that often. So I thought this would be a perfect, perfect way to, to go into it. And so I just looked up real simple, like the definition, right? And I think this is, this is important just to give a sense. And then we're going to run through an example. So Investopedia here says the interest typically expressed as a percentage can either be simple or compounded. Okay. So it's simple interest or compound interest. These are the, the two different options essentially. So simple interest is based on the principal amount, the amount that you put in of that loan or deposit. Whereas in contrast, compound interest is based on the principal amount plus the interest that accumulates on it in every period. So what that means is simple interest the interest percentage, the interest that you earn, let's say, is just very, very simply, huh, based on that initial deposit, okay? It has no bearing on how much additional interest you've earned 
over the time period that is also sitting there in the account that is not factored in in a simple interest calculation. So for instance, let's say just for argument's sake, you put in a thousand dollars into an account and this earned 10% simple interest. Okay. That's obviously n n no such account exists like that, but, but for the sake of the, the ease of math, let's go with that. So that is 10% of a thousand is a hundred dollars, right? So every year, let's say this is simple interest paying 10% every year, every year you would have a hundred dollars deposited into that account. So at year one, you'd have 1100 year two, you'd have 1200 year three, you'd have 13, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't build on it. It's just based on that initial deposit. So Jonathan, is that fairly clear? Yeah. Yeah. So simple interest is better than the coffee can approach, right? So I have a thousand dollars. I put it inside of my coffee can and 40 years later, I have a thousand dollars, whatever <laughs> it would buy for me at that point in time. So if inflation's slowly eating at it, it's actually probably worth a little bit less than a thousand dollars, right? Right. You've got a rusty coffee can and a thousand bucks sitting in there. That's what you've got. But yeah, so simple interest clearly by any definition is much better than that. Right. So that that's kind of the, the one way that I think a lot of us intuitively think about, about interest. Like here's the money I put in, I get this percent every year and that's it. That's the list kind of thing. But how the real world actually works in most cases is based on compound interest. So again, it's based on the principal amount and that interest that accumulated. So this is going to sound small in the first couple of years. So for instance, that very first year, again, using this example is I've got that thousand bucks. I am getting 10% compound in interest, but that's just based on that initial thousand, right? So it's still the hundred dollars. So at the end of year one, I also have $1,100, my thousand bucks plus the 10% interest. But, and now here's where it starts getting magical is the second year's calculation is based on that $1,100. So you get 10% of that 1100, which is $110. Okay. So right there, you've got $1,210 as compared to the $1,200 in the simple interest calculation. Now, Jonathan, $10 doesn't sound like oh, oh, okay. all that big well, of a difference, right? Yeah, just, you know, 10 bucks <laughs> extra. That's nice. That's cute. <laughs> it sounds great, right? You know, I, Einstein allegedly said that uh, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And right, when you're hearing oh, $10, I'm not so sure that means what you think it means, right? <laughs> like, But the beautiful thing is, is playing this out over many years. So the, again, this keeps compounding on itself. So now in this compound interest account, you've got 1,210 and you get 10% of that, right? So you're adding $121 to this as opposed to again, just the hundred dollars, right? And then, okay, I've got 1331. And, and I, I did build this out in a, in a Google doc here, Jonathan, that I know you're, you're looking at. And I think we should maybe like how do you want to present this? Do you want to go ahead to the punchline of 50 years or what do you, what do you think would be the most impactful? Yeah. I mean, let's go down to like, you know, you, you often talk about kind of like this, this 45 year investing lifetime, you know, you've used that with your car example. You have these, you make the choice to, you know, drive a car forever for three 15 year cycles. And so 45 years, you know, if you, if someone, if, if individual one, both individuals started with a thousand dollars, one person got, uh, one person got simple interest on that thousand dollar investment. The other time, the other person, uh, got compound interest of 10%, both of these, just for this example, that entire time, how do they compare by the end of uh, year 45, which is pretty significant for most of us is a solid investing lifetime, 45 years of investment. Yeah, no, that certainly sounds like, like a significant lifetime here in, in investing terms. So let's keep in mind, like, yeah, the, the easiest way to compare this is let's start with simple, right? So very clearly, I think we could all do this math in our head, right? You've got 45 years of getting a hundred bucks each year in simple interest, right? So that's $4,500 plus your original principal of a thousand. So very unsurprisingly, you have $5,500 in this account at the end here of, of year 45. So where I think a lot of us could not conceptually understand is how much more significant the compound interest calculation is. Cause again, we start in year one of, oh, this is 
$110 instead of $100 of interest. And then year two is $121 instead of a hundred, right? Well, in just to, to show the comparison of the difference in that last year, instead of it being $10 difference, it's over $6,000 difference, right? That's the crazy thing. It's $6,626 of difference in interest in just that last year. Now, what is built up here? What the beautiful thing is, again, we're comparing $5,500 is the balance in your account for the simple interest. With compound interest, it is $72,890, almost $73,000. Jonathan, by my calculations, that's over 13 times difference, right? So 5,500 times 13, and you still have some to play with. So 73, nearly $73,000 versus 55, just for that difference in, hey, we're building on the interest. We're adding the interest, and then we're getting a percent of that larger number. So, I mean, this is, it again, it's hard to conceptualize until you see it on paper, and then you have that aha moment. That's why everybody listening to this show, this community is comprised of millionaires and future millionaires. Like it's just a, it's a mathematical certainty that this is where your future is leading you once you understand this. We, we don't go with the coffee can method. We don't, first of all, we don't spend everything we make, right? That's one. Then two, the extra that the bandwidth that we've carved out, we don't just say it needs to be under our mattress. It needs to be in a coffee can. It needs to be because no, because that's not optimized enough. And then now that we understand the difference between simple and compound interest, we're like, well, you know, simple is great, I guess, you know, $5,500 instead of a thousand better than the coffee can method for those of you cash hoarders. But, you know, when we're talking about being multimillionaires, it's not because you crushed it with your income over the long term, over a 45 period of time. You're not a multimillionaire because you made a crazy income. You're a multimillionaire because you saved a disproportionate amount of your income and you got it invested into compound interest vehicles or vehicles that replicate uh, these types of compound interest calculations. It's just incredibly, incredibly powerful. I mean, to, to demo this out, Brad, I just kind of ran, I just wanted people to truly appreciate the magnitude of this. And so I just kind of right next to this, I said, all right, now that we understand the difference between you know, compound interest and simple interest. Everybody's like, Oh, I want, I want to do compound. I want to cut compound interest. I was like, let, what if we were to really test your math skills here? Like, let's say at year zero, you're given this windfall and you're given a choice. Someone says to you, I will give you $1 million right now that you can get your, you know, and I will give you simple interest on this for the next, you know, 45 years, or I'll give you half that amount. I'll give you $500,000 but you're going to make a 10% compounding interest on this, right? This is kind of interesting. Someone's offering you a million dollars now, but you're capped at simple interest. The other person's offering you only half that 10% compound interest. And you're thinking, I wonder what the difference would be 45 years from now between those two. Brad, why don't you break that down for our audience? I think, I think it really encapsulate how powerful this is. Uh, the person that only got 500, they're at a significant disadvantage out the gate here, right? They only they got half as much as the other person, but they understand the power of this investing tactic. Yeah, no, this is, this is super interesting. And, and yeah, what's wild. And again, we're using this 10%. We're not saying that's expected investing returns. Let's everybody be a hundred percent clear on that. This is just for ease of math. Cause it makes it, uh, it easy for us to talk about these original numbers. So, right, Jonathan, not only in this case, are you talking the person who's going with the simple of having a million bucks, but that 10% is an extra hundred thousand to them in year one. Whereas the person starting with 500,000, their 10% that first year is 50,000, right? So you would think they're at a double disadvantage. But I think we know that the punchline is coming here <laughs> and, and I'm looking at the sheet that you put together. So again, unsurprisingly at year 45, the simple interest version has 5.5 million, right? They're getting that hundred grand for 45 years plus the original million that they put in. So 5.5 million, that's really, really clear. And obviously that person's doing okay. You know, they've gotten a hundred grand each year and, and maybe maybe psychologically, that's part of what they said also at the beginning, but, but it's, this is all about math. So that compounding, even starting from half, even starting from only earning 10% of the additional interest that first year at, at year 45, 
they have $36.5 million as compared to five and a half million. So that is a $31 million difference just in that different concept of compound versus simple. I mean, it, it doesn't, it doesn't get more stark than that. So you early 30 year olds that are listening to this, that just hit your first six figures in net worth, you know, maybe you just crossed that hundred thousand dollar threshold. You just realize you're a multimillionaire. Like you, you may not have realized yet it's not going to happen, but the approach that you're taking, the tactics that you're leaning on, uh, are going to leave you quite literally, you're in this community, you're following this path. You're probably going to break 10 million and beyond. Not because this interest rate is guaranteed that you actually make the 10 million, but because time is on your side and you, you know, it was it Einstein, you just mentioned Einstein, Brad, but we didn't Benjamin yeah. Franklin also have a quote about, you know, those who understand compound interest, earn it. Those who don't pay it. I think that's actually Einstein also. That's oh, part Einstein. of the same Man, the quote. I actually didn't it. read it. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like Ben Franklin may have a quote. I should look that up. We quick. Should, well, I just want to give Ben Franklin if we, if, if he deserves it, I don't want to leave him out in the cold. He may not deserve it. Einstein certainly deserves all, all the credit here. So, um, this is powerful. This is such a big concept to understand. We're not saving $5 just to save it when we could go spend it on a burger or whatever. We're, we're saving it for the ultimate luxury, our time. And like what you, what you guys just, what you, what you need to realize about that is that 36 million isn't just 36 million. Even if we went way, way back down to where you had like one or $2 million, you're getting these benefits all along the way. Every single year, these compounding returns are working to your favor. You've started creating income for yourself that you don't need to produce anymore. You don't need to go out and work time for dollars to get that level of income. And that's why we start talking about this isn't binary. There's these milestones, these checkpoints by you setting money aside, making the choice to save money each and every paycheck and get it working towards your benefit using the magic of compound interest. You end up creating an income threshold for yourself that you don't need to worry about anymore. And if we can keep this up long enough, that income threshold passes our expenses. You've reached financial independence or at least a version of it. Yeah. So that ultimately is why we think investing is so important, right? I mean, this is, this is kind of a, a, an arbitrary example that we're using of compound versus simple. I think what we're trying to prove here ultimately by explaining, explaining these concepts so in depth is that compounding is critical. And that's why we don't want to put our money in a coffee can or under the mattress. We want to invest it in the market over a very long period of time because compounding is critical. And that is the way, like Jonathan said, you're not going to get wealthy just based on your income. It's, it's vanishingly rare that someone can do that. You need to make an astronomical amount of money, but you can save relatively reasonable amounts of money and become quite wealthy in an intermediate amount of time, right? A 10, 15, 20 year span, or, you know, again, this investing lifetime of 30 to 45 years, virtually anybody can become extraordinarily wealthy. So yeah, this is, this is a really important concept. And yeah, Jonathan, I just did a, a quick Google search and it looks like Ben Franklin had some 200 year compound interest experiment. We're going to have to, uh, dive into this outside of the 30 seconds of research that I just did, but it looks like it was a 200 year experiment that he bequeathed approximately $4,400 each to the cities of Boston and Philadelphia. And he had this concept of let's let this compound for 200 years and let them benefit these cities. So again, I need to look into this much further, but, uh, anybody who has an interest in this, I'm sure you can just Google, uh, Benjamin Franklin compound interest. That's what I just did. But yeah, we'll, we'll report back on this. This sounds fascinating. Uh, we can, we have a whole nother segment to what we're going to accomplish today, but I just think it's interesting to point out that I have a, a few friends and peers that were in school with me that are aware that I do this show. And one I'm commenting on my Facebook page, they said they, they actually remember me. Like I was on one of my rotations and I was just doodling. Right. But what I was doodling was compound interest, future value calculations. Yeah. It was just like, you were just always mapping. I would map out year one, year 10. I just have my calculator beside it. Like that's a sign that you get it right. Your, your net worth may not equal, you know, your projections at the moment. Um, but you understand the concept and Brad, I know for you, your big light bulb moment was this relative of yours kind of showing you this compound interest calculus. Like this is a massive piece. When you get it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Good memory. That's uh, one of those kind of like 
lightning bolt moments in my life. My aunt Karen helped me get uh, just this little summer internship one year. And the broker that I was kind of basically helping do like cold calls and, and other nonsense like this, like he sat me down in front of a computer and showed me a Roth IRA calculator at that time. And it, it, you know, as I know now, it was just a compound interest calculator, but I could not believe my eyes. It was like, again, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. It changed everything. It's like one of those matrix type moments. And I just understood the value of compound interest and how I, a just regular, normal person could become wealthy over my lifetime. And, you know, it's funny because I did play it out to, oh, wow, if I invested $6,000 a year at nine or 10% until I'm a hundred, I'll be a billionaire. You know, it was something like ridiculous like that. But I mean, for somebody who probably prior to that, didn't know I could become a millionaire or a multimillionaire to think that it was not mathematically impossible to become a billionaire in my lifetime. Like that was pretty darn cool. And, uh, you know, of course the larger, the larger point holds of, wow, this is really powerful. And all of us in this FI community need to understand how, just how powerful it is. We actually have a series of calculators that will run these future value calculations for you. Um, and, and we will actually have those linked up in the show notes for this episode. So this episode is episode 272. You can access it at choosefi.com slash 272. And there will be a link to our calculators if you want to run a similar, similar calculation. It's worth understanding just the basics of how this, how this actually operates. Now, we have just talked about this vehicle of compound interest and simple interest and the coffee can. Most of us understand how, the, how we would invest in a coffee can. And we've tried to dissuade you of doing that. But... There, you would rightly be saying, well, how do you know, what does an investment look like that provides simple interest or what does an investment look like that provides compound interest? And I thought that would be the natural place to go with this because it really sets us up to talking about investing for beginners. You know, where, where do you start investing? And I think that's really what's baked in, uh, to this question that we started the episode with. Yeah. Agreed. I think, I think a lot of people just don't know where to get started. Again, we didn't learn personal finance growing up. Nobody's there to hold our hands and say, open up these accounts and you need to do this and that. Like that just is woefully lacking for so many of us, right? Like we maybe go to college or, or not, we get our first job and we're, this money's coming in and what do you do with it? Right? Maybe you open up a bank account at the bank you're parents had an account with or somebody in your family or the coworker next door. But I mean, there was never an explanation of what to look out for, right? Like what, what fees should you be paying? If any, like what type of accounts do I need? How do I set this up to, uh, you know, even just, I'm thinking with a credit card, things that I take for granted, like how to set this up to pay automatically each month, my entire balance, like all of these just basic fundamental things of how do I set up a framework for my financial life of which Jonathan, certainly investing is a critical, critical piece. But, you know, I actually, I got a question here from Rob Phelan from uh, the simple startup and our choose a foundation. And he actually said that he got a question here from a student in one of the classes that he's taking the choose a foundations curriculum. So we have a pre K through 12 curriculum that talks students through basically the world of personal finance from beginning, you know, from pre-K, from concepts that, that four and five-year-olds can, could understand up to 12th grade level. So, you know, real significant fundamental aspects of personal finance. So this was cool to see this come in. So he said, uh, Derek asked this and Derek said, how long did it take Brad to figure out how banking works and how not to pay interest on his credit card with 30 days for free? So the kind of background to this, and I, this is obviously a much larger question, but the background to this specific thing is in one of the videos that I recorded for, for this class and for the curriculum, I talk about how I use a credit card as a tool that's really a significant aid to me. Whereas so many tens of millions of people get in trouble with their credit cards, right? They are paying 20, 25% interest compounded the worst way, Jonathan, right? Not, not to your benefit, but in, in the negative sense and people are paying late. People are not obviously not paying their balances on time 
on time and in full. And whereas I look at a credit card and say, okay, this to a large degree is frictionless for me. I don't need to have cash on hand. I don't need to pay ATM fees. I don't need to use my debit card, which has significantly fewer safeguards than a credit card does for fraud. I can just use this credit card for essentially everything. And there are significant legal protections for fraud and theft on credit cards. So nobody has access to my, my bank account balance, right? It's just this credit card and the uh, credit card company is, they set up amazing, amazing fraud detection. In my experience, I don't have to pay a fee in most cases. Maybe there's the odd gas station that charges a little bit more for, for per gallon with a credit card. But I mean, those are pretty rare nowadays. So it's pretty frictionless and I don't need to pay it right then. I have to the end of that statement close, and then you get the time period where, you know, you get to actually then pay the card, which is, it usually winds up being from that time of purchase to when you need to pay it, it winds up being 20, 30, even 45 days, potentially, depending on when you buy, when you make this purchase in your statement to when you actually have to pay it. So that is an interest-free loan. Most people don't conceptualize it that way, but that is what it is. This is an interest-free loan from the credit card company to you because they have given you the money to pay for whatever this is that you bought. It's, it's irrelevant what you bought and you don't have to pay them back for 20, 30, 40 days. So, I mean, that is a remarkable, remarkable thing. And again, if, as long as you're paying it on time and in full, you're paying your credit card statement on time and in full every single month there are no fees. There's no interest that accrues. There's nothing. This is just very simply a wonderful tool for people who have their financial life in order and understand that this is a tool. You've made like three or four amazing points there because it's actually, although it sounds like we're talking about credit cards in many ways, we are talking about investing. We're talking about understanding and utilizing compound interest in your day-to-day -day life. And here's the thing that may have just slipped by in all that is that we just did these projections with 10%. 10%, and you just saw how massive the numbers were. And a couple of you rightly so said 10% probably isn't realistic in your long-term investing. If you're, especially if you're a buy and hold long-term investor, we, in fact, you would be right to call it. We normally use kind of around 8% for long-term numbers. That's our kind of rule of thumb is around 8%. Now for the people on the outside of this that aren't, that aren't aware how profitable compound interest can be and aren't aware how powerful it is they're not earning compound interest, they're paying it. So when you have friends and family that say, I can afford the payments, 35 bucks a month is my minimum payment, I'm just gonna pay that. What's happening is they're not paying 10% interest, they're paying 18, 22, 27 and beyond percent interest. This formula, this compound interest formula is working against them to their great financial ruin. But this isn't binary. Like what Brad said is also totally true. These can exist, the credit card is an amazing tool. And the only people that are paying 18, 27% are the, are the ones that like haven't realized this and with urgency gotten to the other side. Um, if you're on the other side of this equation, they, they charge no interest for the first 30 to 45 days. And if you pay it off and pull, you pay nothing. So Brad, your point is also true. It's an interest-free loan. And now you're not talking about these as a destructive financial instrument, but a financial tool that can allow you to reduce friction in your life and allow you to win all along the way, additional protections, uh, and, and no interest. There's no downside for people to understand the rules. Most people aren't taught personal finance. They don't understand the rules, which is why we come up with ridiculous terms like credit cards are evil. No, what's criminal is that we don't teach people how to use these financial instruments. We're going to try and rectify that. Now you do not need to be afraid of credit cards, but you do need to understand how they work. We don't want to pay compound interest, right? We absolutely do not. And it is not wrong. In fact, I would say you should not. Brad would say you should not get a credit card unless you pay your card balance on time and full. And this is not the subjective, I hope I have the willpower to do this. I hope that I remember to pay it each month. No, it's literally when you create the card, you go in and check the box that says auto payment, pay my balance on time and in full, which means we are just using this as a cash flow tool. We are not using this to finance our life. We're using this to reduce friction from our life. Totally different. Uh, case studies on how and why to use a credit card. And Brad, this individual is asking this question. If they could tie that, that, you know, how do I use credit cards responsibly to the power of compound interest? Not only are we going to eliminate compound interest working against us, 
but we're going to start proactively looking for ways to have on compound interest working for us. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And something you said in there was absolutely brilliant. And I don't think people focus on this enough, which is for those people who are maybe anti credit card, right. Or vehemently, like just as a, a doctrine, I'm anti credit card. What you're saying is this is essentially the same for people who are responsible as cash flowing it, because that's what you're doing, right? Like, as far as I'm concerned, I have my credit card set up to auto pay every single month. So instead of paying with cash or a check or a debit card, I'm just paying with this credit card. And then at the end of that period, that money then just comes out of my checking account. So I know that I have the money there. I'm not overspending. I'm not mortgaging my future, right? That's what happens. And, and this is not to take away clearly by any means, Jonathan, we give this caveat every time that tens upon tens of millions of people get in trouble with credit cards. And we're not trying to minimize that at all. In fact, the, the polar opposite, we're trying to educate here of saying only use a credit card only, only, only if you can pay this on time and in full every single month, we cannot say that loudly or often enough. Okay. That is the fundamental backbone of this. But when you think about it as, okay, this is just a proxy for cash or a proxy for my debit card, because I know I have the money in there. I'm not spending extra. Again, I'm not mortgaging my future by saying, oh, I'll pay for it someday. I'll just pay this $35 minimum payment and it all work out. You know, that's not what we're advocating. We're advocating, think of this as cash, but again, you're getting rewards on it. We talk about travel rewards all the time. You're getting this interest-free loan. You're getting the reduction in potential fraud because in most cases you're limited to, I think $50 is the most you can lose for any type of fraud situation. And frankly, I've had fraud on my credit card many times and I've never paid even $1, not less that, that potential $50. So, uh, to me, it's a win, win, win. And again, like you said, you're kind of cash flowing it because it's all coming out in the wash anyway. It's just not coming out of your checking account that day. It's coming out 20, 30, 40 days later. And again, if you think about this compound interest, like we talk about little things, little 1% things making a difference over time, that's 20, 30, 40 days, every single time that you make a purchase that you're holding onto that money and you have it invested somewhere. Because again, money is all kind of fungible. I think about this as my net worth in total. I get to hold on to that piece of my net worth for 20, 30, 40 days, every single time I make a purchase. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool when you just think about this holistically as I'm approaching my personal finances from a position of strength, right? That's what we're doing here. I realized that I could not actually, I, I know where you're going with fungible. I don't know if I could actually define it. So I thought I would educate myself just real quick on the fly here for our audience as well. Those that are playing catch up, uh, fungible means, uh, able to replace or be replaced by another identical item or mutually interchangeable. Interesting, Brad. A little, uh, right. did you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good definition. I'm sorry. I never, obviously, you know, I never want to be the person that uses uh, jargon or lingo or anything. It's just basically saying the easiest way fungible is money is money is money, right? Like I don't think about, oh, I've got it in this pot or this envelope or this account or this whatever or under in my, you know, coffee can or under my mattress. I just think about it as this is all part and parcel of my net worth. So if I can make decisions that are going to impact me positively compounded over years and decades, they're all going to add up. It's that aggregate. It truly is that aggregation of marginal gains that we're always talking about here. It's making these small decisions that work in your favor and just knowing that sure, each individual one is not going to look massive. Just like that first year on simple versus compound interest, it, not only does it not look massive, it doesn't look different at all. The second year is $10 in our example, right? But you see it compound and compound on each other. And I think that's how these little positive decisions work in your life also. I think they start compounding on each other and you start then looking for them, right? And not to mention the other kind of psychological piece of this is you know, my, my kind of joking, half joking, not so much joking of, I spend 10 minutes a month on my personal finances. And I mean, that's accurate. And it's because I've set up systems, right? I've set up systems so that I don't have to think about it. I've set up safeguards where all my credit card bills pay in full 
every single month. I have a little extra cushion in my checking account so that if there is a larger credit card bill or something, I don't have to go scrambling to move money around or whatever. Like I can think about this every couple of months. Now you could make the argument as we've made this entire time that like you want to maximize everything and try to compound as much as possible. And, and I hold to that in a lot of senses, but I think this is the beauty of decision-making, right? And knowing yourself is that I, Brad, I value having that stress reduction so much more than in this case, the little bit of interest that I would have earned on that additional money that I have sitting around. So I'm doing that with eyes wide open. I've made that intentional decision to forego, right? There's an opportunity cost to every decision. There's something that you're giving up. I'm foregoing having that money being invested. I clearly know that, but to me, the peace of mind of not having to stress about my personal finances because I have everything set, I have a system set up that to me is priceless and well worth that opportunity cost. So yes, to every, all the math people out there, I know that I'm foregoing this. There's no question about it, but I am perfectly happy with that. I think one other uh, thing to point out is some people say, well, when you use a credit card, um, you know, you spend more, there's studies. I don't know what these studies are. Maybe there are studies, maybe they're out of date. Maybe they're retrospective. who knows, but there are studies that say you spend an average to 12% more. I don't really take issue with that just general blanket statement. Uh, well, maybe I do at some point, but, but I don't, you know, I don't, that'd be fine. Except that I think that when we're talking about the population, we're not talking about a community, a group of people that are anchored on their why and that understand the power of compound interest. Keep in mind that in this community, we're really focused on how to increase our savings rate to begin with. We're figuring out how can we pay ourselves first? How can we buy our m most precious non-renewable resource, our time? How can we learn how compound interest works and build more of that into our life so we can get to the point where working is optional. When you're starting there, that individual is kind of looking at, you know, saving, paying themselves first and then spending the rest. And this is not a community of people that don't spend money. That's not, it's not about that at all. It's just about understanding how compound work, understanding your position in the game that you're playing right now and figuring out what you want to do next. And if you've already solved the savings, if you've already understand your current trajectory, if you understand your plan and you're happy with that and you know how you're making incremental improvements, if you want to spend a few percentage more, as long as it doesn't derail your plans, you haven't messed up. That's a massive contrast from the vast percentage of the population that doesn't know how much they make, doesn't know how much they spend, has no plan for investing and is making the payments on their credit card to make it from one paycheck. These are two different populations completely. And so the Brad is not worried about spending 12% more on his credit card. It's first of all, it's not happening. And two, he's already got his plan. Like if he spends money, it's in the, it's in the plan. It's already baked in. And so I think under, having these sound financial principles and then living your life on the other side of that, as opposed to there's this evil boogeyman that's going to derail your, your path to financial independence because you use a credit card is just, it's just silly. It's just silly. So, um, we're adults. These are the rules. This is the game. Crush the game. If you were to get a 10% interest rate, these are the types of doodles that I would do when I was doing my rotations. <laughs> Every like thirteen to $15,000 that you save, you know, now, 45 years from now is another million dollars. That's the power. That's the power of knowing these rules and saying, I'd like to be, you know, I'd like to have $10 million. Great. You're starting now. Like what would it look like for us to quickly as possible, get that first hundred K you get that first hundred K saved up and you have a 45 year investing lifetime, you're going to be worth six or $7 million. Like that, that's the sort of numbers that are very easy to run. And if you can intuitively just know those and pull those out at a whim, it really guides some of your decisions. You're like, maybe you don't want this extra piece of plastic that, you know, as soon as the batteries go dead, you'll never be able to find again. You know, maybe, maybe we don't need to just bring more crap into our house. And this is why people say, you know, if you value something, spend lavishly on it. As long as it doesn't derail your plan, spend lavishly on it. But if you don't care about it, why are you going to spend all your money? Cause society tells you to, you know, just to impress them, just to impress them when what you're giving up is literally your future, your time. You know, th th this is a simple choice, but not when you don't understand the power of compound interest. Not when you don't, it's not simple for the vast majority of the population. It's simple for you having listened to this episode and seen these numbers saying like, oh, yep, maybe I should learn how to run these calculations. And you understand just a couple different ways of running them 
to serve you where you are. What's that quote, Brad? Have we decided who to attribute it to? Is it, we decide it's Ben Franklin or Einstein. It's one of these guys. (laughs) (laughs) Those who understand compound interest earn it. Those who don't pay it, the life truth. All right, my friends, uh, many of you are going through the five-day challenge right now, and many of you are sending us your questions. We want to give you the information that serves you all along this journey, every step of the way. Uh, This is not a community of people that have made perfect financial decisions, but it is a community of people that have been exposed to the truth of how this game works, the rules of personal finance, and are making incrementally better decisions and then taking that bandwidth that it affords them and improving every aspect of their life. Rest assured, you have found the right community. The fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.